Hi everyone, I'm Zoe from Vision Ruler. So today, it's mainly we are talking about uh, the prior speakers talking about standards. Here, it's mainly we're talking about how to optimize the standardized encoders. So here the topic is about HEVC. Indeed, we're going to cover different codec because it's all standard aligned and then the video codec right now still mainly follow the motion estimation plus two dimensional transform. So based on this framework, and we're mainly here talking about how to optimize this kind of standardized encoding, but mainly through software. So here is about the software encoding for green. And on top of it, we use HEVC as use case. So here is, uh, we know that for video encoder optimization, people always talk about three things. First, you got to deliver better quality, and to actually try to squeeze out as much bit rate as possible, and then also try to increase the bit rate, uh, sorry, the encoding speed. But then underneath, we also found that to inc increase the encoding speed doesn't mean there's always low delay. So people talk about nowadays, which were more live than VOD, and for this talk, we mainly focus on the underlying CPU usage. For example, if you were given the 16 core or 30 32 core machine, how many B streams you are able to stream out concurrently? So this is something to talk about because if you use less CPU uh, resources, then that should be a little more greener. So here we talk about the how to optimize the coding efficiency and the compute efficiency jointly. That's why we come with the GCL. And underlying this, we don't want to be too big. We just want to make sure that what, we, uh, what I share today is just to kind of give everyone this hint what kind of tricks, what technology we mainly leverage. And finally, we're going to present some data. And this is the whole uh, framework. So we look at the video uh, processing chain. Something related to video encoding optimization First is uh, the capture-wise, we mainly talk about, let's say, the server side. There is uh, some, uh, I think Professor Alan Boke gave a great uh, keynote yesterday, talking about non-reference or blind video quality assessment. So how does that relate to uh, the encoding using, I want to make sure I can see the time down here. And, and uh, we're going to, for example, if you have videos, let's talk about some user-generated content, upload to the cloud, and some actually in the very lousy quality. If you use some of this quality justification, identify some video is already in poor quality, actually, you can just go ahead to throw away the fastest speed level for the encoder to process it. Because no matter what, the quality will be lousy, and the end user won't enjoy it. So in this way, you definitely save a lot of CPU usage. On the other side, people always talk about there's a two-pass encoding or two rounds, meaning that like YouTube, they throw out the video. When they first upload it, they want the user for the first time to enjoy the video. They throw out the fast speed at the very beginning. Of course, that will use relatively more CPU usage. However, after this round, then it will be identified which video will be the house most videos. And for those videos, you can go with the slower speed levels, use more usage, and deliver that. So in this way, the overall processing time for the, the huge amount of videos will be least. So in this way, you also save the CPU usage. And then let's look at uh, this way. So here we talk about some sports videos. Sports videos could be premium and could be some user generated. So in this sports video, when we do HEVC encoding or any other encoding, what we need to do is how do we leverage the minimum amount of bit rate and then to allocate that bit rate into the most perceptually significant areas. In this way, actually, if you have used some pre-analysis, identification, sort of AI type of pre-analyzer, you actually save a lot of partition and internal mode decision trees. Basically, for those decision trees, you can do a lot of early tree uh, pruning. Uh, but what really means with perception system areas? So here, for example, for a uh, sports video, 
And for us, we always talk about foreground is important and background is least important. Indeed, for sports is now. Mo most of the time, the grass areas is very important. If you just spend some, now the sufficient bit rate into those grass area, the grass area become oscillation across frames. It's very disturbing, and the users do not like that. On the other side, the users are very sensitive to those, for example, subtitles with the jersey numbers on top of those like players because some of the users did not only just follow uh, where was the final result. There's a lot of you, uh, audience, they really care about which player is right now where in the play field. So in this area, if it's identified, those areas are most important areas at the very beginning. And then internally, if some area is not falling into that, then basically the early pruning can be applied to those segments. And then your encoder will also become faster. So in this way, finally, you can still deliver the most pleasing content while you use least the computer resources. And here, that's why we mentioned that there's some pre analysis pre-analysis part to guide the encoder. And then here we mentioned if we leverage the quality identifier at the very beginning for the good quality, indeed, you still can use least the purpose setting state in that because the quality is already good. If the quality is not ideal, you actually can throw the least the complicated arguments down there because the quality in the end will be lousy anyway. And then on top of it, after we talk about all this into the core of the encoder, we know that encoder, there's a lot of decisions that need to be made. And then there's always a way, I would say that using the machine learning to actually optimize the video encoders in some way. So this slide I actually used previously for the AV1 side because my background, I knew AV1 better, but it doesn't mean that this slide is actually Next slide, I'm going to talk about this little bit of VVC. So here, we want to see that how we leverage machine learning to actually accelerate the encoder optimization. So I'll give one example. See, it's actually it's some work we collaborated with some uh, research in the field, but it's actually the same idea that you can apply to the HEVC or even v, uh, AVC encoder optimization. This is mean that why you make the uh, decision tree, I think this is not new. So we know that for every block, for example, it's a 32 by 32, you can actually extract some features in a quick way, like the mean, variance, contrast needs, and use those features, you can treat some classifier. So when we talk about classifier, it is machine learning. Machine learning doesn't mean that's a big model. It doesn't mean they have a deep learning with a lot of parameters. And machine learning, we would say that is also uh, support vector machine here we use, or it's just the one hidden layer of the neural network, just like a matrix uh, matching, and then the parameters are very limited. However, with this way, you can identify what is this. For example, you do the partition. Here we talk about this is the VVC because this is the work uh, we recently uh, has been doing, and then let's just go directly to this. And then there's uh, so many partition opportunities, even inside HEVC. At least you have to able to identify for the current block, should I step in this four, four block partition or should I go deeper? So it's basically a decision tree for this partition. And we all know that if we know the partition, as early as possible, it can save a lot of RDO uh, mode decision and transform and also entropy coding. So in this way, what we were proposing, if you can extract the very effective features and fit into the learning model, that model actually can learn instead of hard coding inside of the encoder and learn from frame through frame from one segment to the others. And then for this way, it's still suboptimal. But the partition you finally choose at the early pruning will actually close to the ideal coding efficiency while you achieve compute and energy efficiency. So here we give example. It's uh, not big enough, but then after the result in the bottom middle is our proposed record. This is for VVC, and we found that this is a lot of speed up, but actually close to the result of VTM. 
And then we finally gave a result. Here's the result is actually we leveraged indeed of the previous all the points we just addressed. But here we just want to see that if we still try to encode HEVC, how fast we can get. And the, the result are here, we chose six uh, a public available video is mainly 1080p, and then what we did is we threw them into a 16-core machine in AWS. And what we did, we just have FMPEG, and run FMPEG either one stream, two stream concurrently, or multi streams concurrently. Here is at most is a 16, and then the feeder of the videos is actually we simulate the live scenario. For example, if the source is a 1080p 50, and then that means that the, the highest frame rate for the encoding speed is just the 50. And uh, for simultaneous two, meaning that in this 16 core machine, we run two FMPEG encoding at the same time. The same instance, if each of the stream can actually achieve the encoding speed as opposed to the original frame rate, that means that you can encode that the two streams live. And then for those red numbers, meaning that the encoding speed cannot catch up the original frame rate, meaning that you cannot throw them because it's not going to encode live, and then you cannot afford to encode so many. The reason, just now as mentioned, that if you have a 16 core machine, of course you can talk about encoding this speed as fast as possible, but in the real case, customer mentioned that if I have this machine, they at least have multiple renditions and they want to encode 1080p to different rendition, even for rend rendition, they want to encode into different bit rate. So this is a real case. We simulate that uh, uh, here, we only just uh, for simplicity, for fixed different resolutions as a different bit rate, how many concurrent bit streams we can achieve live. But in the real case, the customer will mention that I gave you 1080p, uh, what the end users, I should not, uh, mainly I should mention that the, the end users, they just want to see that if I want to encode this 1080p to two renditions, uh, different resolution, but each of them have, have different bit rate all together for five channels, for example. And you can look at this. In, so here we just mentioned this is a coding efficiency, meaning that at this setup, we still maintain this optimized, it's a standard line, HEVC encoder applied all the technologies I just mentioned in the previous slide, as opposed to X264 medium and X265 very fast. And that means that for different metrics and the new scheme is still achieve the coding efficiency. On the other hand, let's see whether the compute cores actually largely reduced even compared to X for medium and the number of cores close to use only half of the cores as opposed to the whole X264 delivered. Up, uh, up, as opposed to X265, very fast is about one third of the CPU cores. So in this way, it shows this result that we are able to maintain an even better coding efficient encoder by use least possible uh, trying to use the least possible CPU cores. So that's actually about my talk. Okay, thank you, Zoe. Um, any, any questions? Okay. Yeah, hi. Um, very interesting, the uh, uh, overall and uh. impressing performance. Uh, for, really impressed by the FPS. Um, I have a question for the partitioning. Um, when you uh, I, I, the decision there is uh, whether to split or not to split. Right, yes. Right. Mm. And um, have you, but th this is something we also experienced where it's a great potential of uh, reducing the runtime. Uh, we found out that if you just stop at a certain level and do not evaluate further or check uh, that this already provides you a, a nice speed up. Um, do you have an, just a number in mind uh, what you can get compared to just skipping at a certain or just stopping the partitioning uh, at a certain level and not further splitting down compared to allowing it? But uh, do uh, you know what I mean? <laughs> yes, I think I got it what you meant, what, what you meant because we went through the same thing. It's, uh, the simplest way is just to stop at a certain level and then you correlate it with the block size. 
And then, so that's one way. But for some areas, it just become hard. Like I mentioned that if you have some edges, that's why I mentioned um, because um, this is all curly. The video is very complicated. And and let me just put. I just want to uh, deliver some at least uh, some some of our experiences because sometimes. Uh, even doesn't mean it, the, the AI of AIs. If you have a model, you try to find the correlation, then you'll be able to find there's the insights between them. And for certain area, you'll be able to find how do I, even in this area, it really needs to go uh, smaller partitions. But you try to find what are the features that you can extract the result and really get into that depth. Go ahead. Yes, I, um, you said you used um, uh, ROI analysis at the beginning and then ML training for the partition analysis. Mm -hmm. um, one of the problems we've run into with similar techniques is, is um, that there, there's really two problems. The first problem is when you do ROI analysis, you can overemphasize foreground features, de-emphasize background features, creating you know the blurry background effect. Uh, that's one issue. The second issue is for your ML training of the particular partition modes. Um, one of the problems is uh, is sensitivity to the particular content type. So then you have to pre-classify your content classes and things like that. Have you experienced that problem? Yes, and then. Because sometimes uh, we, we, we here talk about there's a premium content, there's a PUGC and the UGC. So I'm not sure whether I catch the third one. We can further discussion. What, what I meant is uh, we found it's not only the idea of foreground and background. And then we actually have some pre-knowledge. For example, if this user case is about sports, and you should really quickly to identify some good background areas. We want to emphasize the traditional image processing. Actually, you can analyze where those areas with, for example, you can extract the, uh, one thing is if inside there's a sharp edge, you can use edge detector. And on the other side, you can detect whether there's a less entropy or higher entropy. So you can calculate the entropy of that block. And based on entropy, you'll be able to know that whether it is a artificial or computer-generated content. What I meant is computer-generated content if the jersey number is actually falling into that category. And then in that way, it's very important you only put a little bit more bits onto that because that's sensitive to the human eyes. And uh, this is very hard to say that whether this is two type of segmentation we right away, but for certain things, you have to input the prior knowledge. It's not too hard if you have a long list of pre-knowledge, right? It doesn't have that much info. The video have a lot more information compared to the neural network models. If you have all these least decision trees that guide to you, I would say maybe you have a lot of if and else inside the code, but indeed, in the end, that won't take much time from the encoder. Okay. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you. All right. If I can have the next.